Hello, everybody. Happy Friday. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. We're starting to get you flowing in here. Welcome. Yeah, really, really good early morning if you're in Australia. Yeah, no kidding. And good evening from Europe, and thanks for being with us. We've had a lot of Australia. If you're from Australia, can we get that in the chat? I'd love to hear that. Anybody from Australia? <laughs> Sorry, Luxembourg from Alice. That's nice. <laughs> okay. Luxembourg. Okay. Hey, well, that's great. Let's get some more locations in the chat. So um, if you're new here, this is something we like to do at the beginning of every webinar. If you'll put in the chat where you're, chat, where you're chatting in from, uh, industry if you want. I love this. This is always exciting. We have a really global audience here. Palo Alto, Germany, Rancho Cucamonga, Hungary, Birmingham, Chicago, Atlanta, Ottawa, Stafford, UK, Vancouver, BC, Michael from London, we got Evelyn. These are coming in too fast, I can't read them. Connie <laughs> can't in the, from Manila. Manila. You guys are all over the place. Dusseldorf, Germany. I think that's a new one. Oh, that's great. Okay, next thing I'd like to see in the chat is I'd like a yes. If you've been on one of our previous webinars, put a yes in the chat. Yes, yeah, see, I love to see that. That's great. Welcome back, guys. Welcome back. So this is the... Um, fifth webinar in the psychological safety series. So if you haven't been with us before, we did a four webinar series on the four stages of psychological safety. Um, we did one on stage one, inclusion, stage two, learner, stage three, contributor, and stage four, challenger. So if you didn't get a chance to watch those webinars with us live, they're on our YouTube channel. So you can go to uh, YouTube, search Leader Factor, and you can watch those webinars later. Uh, this one will also be recorded. So if it's late for you and you need to get to bed, don't worry. Uh, we'll send a recording your way a couple days uh, after this airs. So probably early next week, we'll send out an email to everybody who's registered for this webinar. Uh, it'll have the recording and any of the links that we talk about today. We'll be mentioning a few materials. There's going to be a giveaway at the end of the webinar. And so if you hang around, uh, you'll be able to participate in that. So um, with that, we'll start with just a little bit of housekeeping. It looks like most of you are Zoom pros. I think we all probably should be at this point. Uh, but for those of you who are new, we've got the chat box. And if you put all panelists, that'll go just to the Leader Factor team. If you put all panelists and attendees, that will go to everyone. And so just make sure that you understand that distinction. Uh, we get a lot of rich feedback and commentary here in the chat. And we wanna make sure that everybody has a chance to see those wonderful comments. So when you do answer a question, we're gonna be asking you to participate in the chat. So make sure you put all panelists and attendees. A couple asks today. If you've been enjoying the webinars, we'd like you to contribute in a couple ways that would help us as well. The first thing would be to leave an Amazon review on the book if you haven't already. The second would be to follow us on LinkedIn and YouTube. That would help us tremendously get this content out to a broader audience and it will help you stay up to date with everything we're putting out in the area of psychological safety. This is the place to be if you're interested in psychological safety. So make sure you follow us on those channels and stay up to date with everything that we're doing. So with that, let's get going. Today, we are talking about how to measure psychological safety, something we're very excited about and something that we're thrilled to be able to share with you, something that previously has been very difficult, if not impossible. But with the four stages model and some technology that we're going to show you today, it's now possible to do in a very effective way. So with that, I'll introduce Tim. Our host today is Dr. Timothy Clark. He's our founder and CEO. He's an Oxford trained social scientist who's been doing survey research and instrument design for over 25 years and is a real expert when it comes to psychological safety. And Tim, if you'll go back a slide, I do wanna highlight the book. 
If you guys haven't had a chance, definitely pick up the book. It's called The Four Stages of Psychological Safety and is an overview of the four stages. We go in depth in each of the four stages, a lot of personal experiences from Tim and really a great deep dive into the world of psychological safety as it pertains to inclusion and innovation. We're gonna talk a little bit about that today. So with that, Tim, I'll turn it over to you and we'll get things going. Let's do it. So we're gonna talk about, well, first of all, welcome to everyone. We're really glad to have you and we, this can be an interactive experience. So get ready to use your chat box and we're gonna use some polling questions. We're gonna do some real time research so we're here to talk about how to measure psychological safety. So I wanna begin with the steps. And for some of you, this will be great. And you're very interested in this because maybe you're a IO psychologist or a psychometrician or a methodologist. And then the rest of you, you don't care too much about the technical side, but you wanna to get to the meat of, of how we measure this. Let me just take you through. So the first thing that we do is we deconstruct the concept of psychological safety based on qualitative and quantitative research, right? So we have to take this concept apart. And then number two, we operationalize it. That means we convert it into observable and measurable actions and behaviors, that's step two. Then number three, we build psychometric scales, uh, sets of survey items that measure the actual actions and behaviors that we're interested in, that's step three. Step four, we test those scales for validity and reliability. We, we run statistical analyses on that. And then we fine tune it, right? There's a little fine tuning that we have to keep doing. And then the last step is that we're building a global normative database. And that's exactly where we are today. We're building a global normative database. As a matter of fact, um, it was interesting as a team, we, were, we, we sat around yesterday and we were looking at the results of an organization that we did the survey, the, the team survey with from Australia. Just yesterday, it was absolutely fascinating to see the results and to see how, uh, how global this really is, how universal it is and how relevant it is, especially in 2020 and this new decade, which is the decade of culture as you probably know. Okay, so let's begin with a polling question. Let's get right to it. So uh, Junior, if you could bring this polling question in. Here's the question. There it is. When, there, there it is. When you begin interacting in a new work setting, what is your first concern? Go ahead and answer that question. And then we'll show you the results. What is your first concern out of these four things? Make sure you read all the options before you answer. Yep. We're getting some good votes in here. We're up over 150. Keep them coming. Keep them coming. We're going to ask you for these throughout the webinar. So if we need more participation. Really, please participate because we have a sample set. We have a sample size today that's big enough that we yeah. that our data is projectable. Yeah. So yeah, we're. We're closing in on 250. This is good, guys. Keep it coming. <clears throat> okay, good, good. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and end this one. All right. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and share it with you. So take a look here. Okay. So check check out these data. This is real-time data. Very, very, very important. When you begin interacting in a new work setting, what is your first concern? 46% of you said feeling included. That exactly matches the research that has gone into building the team survey, the psychological safety team survey. So the pattern is, and this is a universal pattern, and you've just validated this, the universal pattern is that when a human being goes into a social setting, the first thing they're concerned about is feeling included, belonging, acceptance, inclusion, that's the pattern. Now, are there some except, exceptions to the pattern? Sure, but we're interested in the empirical pattern. Okay, let's go to the second question. Here's the second question. Based on your overall experience, which of these four things is the riskiest thing to do in a social setting? 
What do you, what's, what's the most frightening thing to do of these four things? Where, where do you assign the highest risk? Go ahead and, and answer this question, if you would, please. Another very important pattern that we have tried to identify through empirical research. We love data. We've got to extract the patterns out of the data. I'll give us about five more seconds to get to 250 here. Okay. And then we'll share it. I think you, you guys are going to find this interesting. Okay. All it's right. the riskiest thing. Here we go. Whoa, there we go. So no surprise, right? No surprise. Challenging the status quo is the single riskiest thing to do out of these four things. And you'll see later why challenger safety is stage four. It's the highest culminating stage of psychological safety. And you've just verified that empirical pattern. Okay, let's go to question three. Generally speaking, which one of these two activities do you do first as you work with others? Which comes first for you most of the time, generally speaking? Learn or contribute? All right, we'll close this one out. Okay. There we go. And so once again, you have verified the empirical pattern. Humans, we follow a sequence where we, where we learn and then we contribute. Now, if we go into a situation and we're already an expert and we're competent and we're seasoned and we have lots of experience and skills and knowledge, then we can hit the ground running and we can contribute. But the overall sequence, right, is that we learn first and then we contribute. So you've just experienced and you've just verified the empirical pattern that undergirds the model, the four stages model of psychological safety. So here's what we know. Psychological safety is not binary. It's not a matter of having it or not having it. It's a matter of degree and it actually progresses in stages. You just said yourself, the first thing most of the time, the pattern is the first thing that human beings are looking for in a social setting is inclusion, acceptance, belonging, and then we progress from there. So we're going to go deeper into this. Here's the overall agenda. So I'm going to back up and I'm going to tell you the story of psychological safety, which I think you'll find fascinating. And then we're going to talk about the explosion of interest that we now have in this concept and why. And you, I'm sure you can guess why. We'll talk about why it's delicate and dynamic. And we'll get into the four stages framework. And then finally, the technology platform that we use globally. Okay, so let's begin. The basic concept of psychological safety is that it's not expensive to be yourself in a social setting. If it is expensive, well, what do we do? Well, we curl up, we withdraw, right? If it's socially or emotionally or politically or economically expensive, we change our behavior. And that is what the research shows. That's what these data show us. We change our behavior. Now let's talk a little bit about the story. And it begins in 1943. Here's the history of the concept. In 1943, as you may know, Abraham Maslow he published his hierarchy of needs. And after the physical needs and the security needs, he talked about belongingness needs. That was the next stage in this hierarchy. So he began with that term. And we're, we're, most of us were familiar with that terminology. Herbert Simon came around in 1947 and he said, you know what, in social settings and organizations, we need attitudes of friendliness and cooperation. And I'm quoting that. This is his language. He said, this is what we need. This is an enabling condition. Then Carl Rogers, the great psychologist, he came around and in his research, he talked about unconditional positive regard. Those were his words. 
that we need to demonstrate that and give that to each other in social situations and in organizations. And then Douglas McGregor, he came onto the scene and he talked about egoistic needs. So he, he used a little bit different language, but a similar concept. And then Joseph Sandler, feelings of security. Then in 1965, Edgar Schein and Warren Bennis from MIT, they coined the term psychological safety. So that's where the term begins. And now we start to consolidate the research under one term that we're sharing. Then we have William Kahn from Boston University that puts forward some incredible research and shows how psychological safety shapes behavior. And then in 1999, Amy Edmondson from Harvard, she publishes this seminal article that demonstrates using statistical analysis that psychological safety drives learning. She shows some correlation coefficients that we just can't ignore. And so we understand now that psychological safety is this enabling condition that leads to learning and performance. So that's a little bit about the history. And then what happens is, based on the research this, that, that I've been doing for the last three years, we're able to identify that psychological safety progresses and is measurable by stage right, by stage. And there's this sequence that is unmistakable and it's universal across cultures, across demographics, across nations. Okay, why, why is there such interest, this explosion of interest in 2020? So let me ask you that question. Go to your chat boxes. Why is there an exploding interest in psychological safety across the world? So what do you think? What, what's, what's your opinion on this? What, why are you here? Why, why the interest? Junior, help us out with this. Fear, DNI, Black Lives Matter movement, don't feel safe, terrorism, COVID, global uncertainty. Man. <laughs> Google's Project Aristotle, the world yep. needs to change. Yep. It impacts every interaction as the basis for learning growth. That's great. You know, I love that. I love that. Yeah. Who said that? It impacts every interaction. It does. Yep, Lee. Nancy says, because none of us feel safe. I, I think a lot of us feel that right now. Yeah. Chase says, the impact of COVID and social justice issues, that sums up a lot of it right now. Yeah. Inclusion, higher expectations for how we want to be treated. Um, Edith says, engagement and retention. That's for sure. Yeah. Don, George Floyd. Yeah, these are all relevant issues, guys. Kimberly, education, fantastic. remote work during the pandemic. Fantastic. All, all of these are great, guys. Yeah, fantastic. Let, let me give you a little perspective. Our, our perspective and your insights um, totally agree. We're in a very uh, dynamic and turbulent environment. <clears throat> here's, what, here's what we kind of think as we, as we are working with organizations around the world. Organizations around the world seem to share at least two goals right now. We have two common goals. Here's what we think they are. Number one, to create a sanctuary of inclusion. That's number one. And that's really a goal that we see organizations sharing across cultures and continents. And then number two, to create an incubator of innovation. Why? Because innovation is the lifeblood of growth. These are the two, these are the two common goals, the jobs to be done that most organizations share. Create a sanctuary of inclusion, create an incubator of innovation. Now let me, let me uh, dive into this. I'll dig a little bit deeper. Here's our, here's our point of view and I'm gonna get my pen out for this or my highlighter. There are two forces at work. Whoops, let me see if I can get my highlight. There we go. There are two forces at work that are driving psychological safety. The first force is social injustice. And many of you just 
alluded to that and you talked about things that are going on in the world that are creating or perpetuating social injustice. That is a moral force. And that moral force is driving inclusion or the demand for inclusion. And that moral force is exerting itself on organizations as never before. Never in my lifetime have I seen such momentum from the moral force. Now on the other side, we have market, market turbulence. And we're talking about the conditions in which we live and work. And that market turbulence is beyond anything. It's an order of magnitude beyond anything that we've seen. That market, market turbulence is calling, is calling forth a competitive force that's driving innovation. So even, here's an interesting thing. Even the hardcore authoritarian bosses that we work with, the command and control, fear and intimidation, take no prisoners bosses, you know what's happening to them? They are, they, they, even resentfully, they're being constrained to acknowledge that, you know what, we need psychological safety. Because if we don't have psychological safety, I can't get people to work together productively. They, they are not collaborating productively. Instead, what are they doing? They're managing personal risk. And I can't have them do that. I need them to innovate. And so even leaders that have been resentful or they don't care about social injustice issues, they are coming to the table and they're saying, you know what? I get it. And if, if nothing else, from a competitive standpoint, I have to acknowledge that psychological safety is an enabling condition and we absolutely need it. And we're not going to survive without it. And we're going to bleed out our top talent. We're not going to be able to attract and retain the talent that we need. So these two forces, the moral force and the competitive force are driving psychological safety. And it's not going away. This is not something that is going to be a transitory uh, force or a trend that comes and goes. It's here to stay and it's building momentum. Tim, can I make a quick comment? Yeah. There was a comment in the chat from Greg. So it got a lot of attention in the chat. He says, everyone wants innovation, but no one feels safe challenging the status quo. Paradoxical. And it goes, it speaks to the point of the authoritarian boss. And they're coming to terms with the reality of the culture stifling innovation. It can only progress so far in a culture where fear and intimidation is present. And so That's they're right. saying, look, if we really do want an innovation, an innovative team, even for just flat performance sake, we need to do it. That's very true. You guys remember the statement by Peter Drucker, right? Culture eats strategy for breakfast. How about culture eats innovation for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? You cannot innovate unless you have the enabling conditions in the culture. You just can't do it. So let's, we're, we're gonna talk about that. So here's the culture thesis. The culture thesis has two premises. Number one, conditions drive behavior. And number two, behavior drives performance. So think about that. This is the culture thesis. This is what undergirds our, our our understanding of the way that we innovate. Innovation is a social process primarily. Okay, now let's take it a step further and let's talk about this next concept, which is that psychological safety is incredibly delicate and dynamic. There's nothing permanent about it. Now, let me ask you some questions. You ready? Let's, get in, let's, let's go to our chat boxes again. Who is most responsible for the level of psychological safety on a team. Who's most responsible? Leader. Think? Leader, leader, leader. Dumbledore, yes. <laughs> <laughs> leader, leader. Okay, team but let leader. me ask you a question. 
What about the executives? What about the senior leaders? If we're talking about a team, who's most responsible? Me, everyone. Okay. CEO, all leaders, starts at the top, has to be team focused. Okay. Okay, so we're getting a little bit of disagreement here. Okay. <clears throat> Now this is quite interesting. Everyone influences the culture. We know that. Everyone is a curator of the culture. Everyone is an architect of the culture. We all play a role. We all have a stewardship. But the most profound expression of culture is found at what level? It's the team level. It's the team level. And what the research shows is that the team leader has the single most important influence on the prevailing norms of that team. Now There's others influence it. There's sorry, a comment in here. I think it's Shad Shadina. I'm sorry, I forgot your name wrong, but she said everyone, but leaders have the onus to make the environment safe. That's okay. right. That's right. And, and we have yet to see an exception to that pattern. That is the pattern. Here's another, here's another question for you. How fast can the level of psychological safety change on a team? What's your perspective on that question? What do you think? How fast? Instantly, nanosecond. Okay, how does it change that fast? So, so what did we say? We said it's delicate and dynamic, totally agree. But now you're saying it can change instantly. It can change in a nanosecond. What? can cause it to change in a nanosecond. It builds slow, it collapses in a second. So it collapses in a second. Betrayal. Okay, now let's talk about another body of research or a related vein of research. It can collapse in a second based on what we call a breach of psychological safety. And a breach is based on a single act. Let me give you some examples. Someone ignores you in a discussion. Someone interrupts you. Someone makes a comment that kind of jabs you and it's in a public setting, right? These are breaches of psychological safety and they can reduce the level of psychological safety in an instant. Absolutely true. We're getting a lot of comments. Question. We're getting a lot of comments from microaggressions in the yeah. chat. Yeah, microaggressions. Some are very subtle. Some are very overt. And then there's everything in between. So you, so we realize that psychological safety is dynamic. Day in and day out, it can it can go up and down a little bit, okay, or a lot, depending on the behavior first and foremost of the team leader, and then our colleagues and peers. I've got to call out this comment. So yeah. Chris MacArthur says, we're wired for threat and remembering the negative, Teflon for positive and Velcro for negative. That's right. good. Great comment. Great comment. Okay, here's a related question. How do team members respond when the level of psychological safety is inconsistent? If you're living and working in an environment where it's inconsistent, what happens? What do you think? They assume the worst, they disengage, they're on edge. They're like a child with inconsistent parenting, no kidding. Very good. Disengaged, lack of trust, they don't respond. They shut down, they go silent. They become defensive. They worry all the time. Yep. Even though psychological safety is there, maybe most of the time, right? Maybe most of the time. What if psychological safety is there 95% of the time? So back to that comment, what do we do as humans in social settings? We're constantly engaged in threat detection. And we're constantly, we're running this calculation and this analysis over and over and over. We do it every day. Threat detection. 
is it safe or is it unsafe? If it's safe, I will offer a performance response. If it's unsafe, I will offer a survival response. That's what makes all the difference. A performance response means I'm playing offense. I'm engaging, right? I'm contributing all that I can. And a survival response means I'm managing personal risk. It's self-preservation. It's loss avoidance. That's a very different response. We do this every day, even though we work on the same teams every day with the same colleagues every day. Now, of course, things change, but it's very dynamic. So this analysis that we do over and over again is to ask ourselves, is vulnerability our acts of vulnerability? An act of vulnerability could be as simple as asking a question, expressing a point of view, right? We want to know if acts of vulnerability are being punished or rewarded. And we are constantly doing that analysis. That is an analysis that is never done. So here's some terminology that we use. A blue zone is an environment of rewarded vulnerability. A red zone is an environment of punished vulnerability, right? So let's go back to the culture thesis. Conditions drive behavior. Am I in a red zone or a blue zone? And then the behavior drives performance. Okay, so let's jump into the four stages framework. Based on the empirical research that we've done and you verified today, here's how psychological safety works. Let me get my highlighter out. It is a function of two things. Whoops. Let me go back. Two things, respect and permission. It's the fusion of these two dimensions. And they give us various levels of psychological safety. The first level or stage is what we call inclusion safety. Inclusion safety is the foundation. It means that you feel a sense of belonging, acceptance you've been included. It's the threshold, it's the foundation, and then we build on it. And why is that stage one? Because you just verified the pattern. The first thing that humans are concerned about is, do I, can I be included here? Can I be accepted here? Do I feel a sense of belonging here? So this is always stage one. Then we go to stage two, learner safety. Now we begin to engage in the discovery process. Can I ask questions? Can I give and receive feedback? Can I experiment? Can I make mistakes? That becomes the next natural stage to satisfy the sequence of basic human needs. Then we go to stage three, contributor safety. Contributor safety means that I, I, I have now have this natural instinct to use and apply what I've learned. My skills, my talents, my abilities, my experience, everything that I've learned, I want to go use it. I, because our, my natural instinct is I want to make a difference. I want to contribute. I want to participate in that value creation process. That's what's happening in stage three. Then we go to stage four, the culminating stage, challenger safety. Do I feel free and able to challenge the status quo without jeopardizing my standing or reputation, without being marginalized or punished or embarrassed? And you said yourselves, right? In the, in the response to the question, that challenging the status quo was the very hardest thing to do. That's where, mo that's where the highest risk is uh, in terms of our behavior. And so we know that. So we, we've been able to distill out this four-stage model, which is, again, universal across culture, across cultures. So psychological safety means Here's the operationalized definition. It means you can do four things. Number one, feel included. Number two, feel safe to learn. Three, feel safe to contribute. And then finally, feel safe to challenge the status quo. And you can do all those things without feeling embarrassed or marginalized or punished in some way. Guess how many, so here's a question for you. Go to your chat box. How many teams demonstrate 
psychological safety at the level of challenger safety. So let me go back, challenger safety at the top. What percentage of teams, what do you think? Jeff, 12%, very theory. specific. Okay. <laughs> Just kind of order of magnitude. Okay, yeah. good. 5%, 10%, 10%. Yep. So 8%. right now, in our, our, our normative database is growing, but right now it's between 5 and 10. So many of you have a very good intuitive sense. Oh, I love this. So Hector says 4.333. Very good, Hector. <laughs> We're That's rewarding pretty, pretty bizarre chats. We should probably stop doing that. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Okay, so a little bit more detail, right? Uh, so here are the four stages, but a couple of patterns here. If your respect is high, but your permission is low, you fall into a paternalistic pattern where you, you respect people, but you're not letting them do anything. Because you, you, right? So you're a helicopter parent. Pat your children on the head, but just tell them, don't touch anything. Don't touch anything. I love you. Don't touch anything. I had a boss like that. He said, Tim, you know, I love you basically, but don't touch anything. So he wanted to put me on a leash about this long and then we could have a lot of fun together. Who wants to do that? That's paternalism. And sometimes very well-meaning leaders who are very benevolent in terms of their intent they're still paternalistic and they, they, they've got to change that behavior. They have to shift uh, psychologically in the way that they're leading people. The other pattern here is exploitation. Low respect, high permission. In other words, I don't, I don't have high regard for you, but I want the value. I want to extract the value that you can create. That's exploitation. I don't value you, but I value the value that you can create. And so we see that as well in organizations. And that is a failure pattern. Okay, so stage one, just to review, means that you feel included, you feel that you can belong. The social exchange is that I, if I'm human and harmless, you invite me into your society. Stage one inclusion safety is a human right. It's not earned, it's owed. And this is where the moral force is, is really exerting itself on organizations right now because we realize that inclusion safety truly is a human right, regardless of demographics or psychographics. Those things are irrelevant. Stage two, learner safety means that you can engage in the learning process without being embarrassed or harshly criticized or marginalized. Here's the exchange. The leader or the organization encourages the learning in exchange for engagement to learn. But who goes first? Who goes first? The leader goes first. The organization goes first. Why? Because sometimes the individual doesn't has, have the confidence doesn't have the self-efficacy to engage in the learning process, brings lots of inhibition and fear to the learning process. So the organization, the leader goes first. That's the stewardship. Stage three, contributor safety. I wanna weigh in and use my knowledge and experience and ability. So what's the, what's the exchange? The organization and the leaders grant autonomy and accountability in exchange for what? Results. So this is where we have to produce results. This is the social exchange at stage three. We'll give you accountability, we'll give you autonomy, we'll give you creative license to a certain degree, right? We'll establish the parameters, but you've got to deliver the results. That's a fair exchange for contributor safety. And then the last one, challenger safety. Ooh, this is the hard one. Here's the exchange. Air cover. We give you air cover in exchange for candor. We want your candid feedback. We want your dissent. We want your creative abrasion. But we've got to give you air cover. If we don't give you air cover for that, 
then that's disingenuous. You're not going to give us the candor. That doesn't make sense. How many bosses have you heard say, you know, they're authoritarian, they push the fear button, and then they say in the next breath, when I need your real honest feedback on this. What? What, what, what? That doesn't work, right? That's a disingenuous request. Human beings don't respond to that. So this is the social exchange. To summarize challenger safety, it means that the leader is increasing intellectual friction and decreasing social friction at the same time. So that the collaboration, right? We have lubricating oil for that collaboration. That's what challenger safety does. Okay, so here's a summary of the four stages. This is the operationalized definition of psychological safety. And what we have learned is that it is a stage-based phenomenon and it is measurable by stage. So let's take a look at how we measure this now globally and how we're building our global normative database. All right, guys. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and show you some of the technology. So can I get a yes if you see a login screen in the chat? Can you show me a yes? Nice. Beautiful, okay. So I'll go ahead and show you how we've done this. Okay, now we're in. So this is the combination of content, technology, and design as it relates to psychological safety. We've taken the four stages model and we've incorporated it into technology and design to make sure that we can not only speak about psychological safety in theory, but we can measure it and then implement actionable steps to improve it over time when it comes to a team. So the first thing that happens inside of the four stages team survey platform is very similar to a lot of other team surveys that you might do. Think of an engagement survey mechanically. This is very similar. So we want to survey all of the members of a team and ask them what they think about their experience with the team as it pertains to the four stages. So Tim talked about bringing the concept of psychological safety down and creating scales to measure it. So that's what we've done. We've created a 12 item survey with four different scales. Each of those scales measures a stage. So a scale of three items measures inclusion, a scale of three items measures learner safety, contributor safety, and challenger safety. We take all of that data, we aggregate it, and then put it into a dashboard for you so you can see how the team is performing. So the first thing that we're gonna look at is your overall score. Based on our normative database so far, we've given some descriptors to a few different categories. So zero to four at risk, four to six limited, six to seven stable, seven to nine strong, nine to 10 exceptional. And as Tim said, a very small percentage of teams are falling into this exceptional category, especially when it comes to challenger safety. So then what we do is after we take the overall score, we break it out into the four stages to give us a little bit more specificity. And we start to crack open the team to see about what's, see what's going on. So you can see inclusion, learner, contributor, and challenger. And this helps us see at the stage specific level what's happening on our team. And there are patterns. And this data is dummy data, and so it's not necessarily going to be representative of the averages. But what we typically see is that challenger safety is much lower than the others. And usually we'll see kind of a falling pattern from inclusion down to challenger. And sometimes learner and contributor will swap spots, and depending on the culture, you may see some change. But that's, the, that's generally the trend that we see when you move through the four stages. Now, this is where it starts to get really interesting. So then we move to question averages. So these are all of the items in the survey rank ordered by score. So the top performing item in this case, my team allows me to do my job. The lowest performing item, I feel safe disagreeing with the way my team does things. And then this is filterable by stage. So if I click inclusion, I can see the inclusion items, learner, contributor, and challenger. So this is very interesting. It helps us start to unpack the team and see very specifically what's going on. 
And then after that, we move into recommendations. And this is something that I think is very neat and something that's been very well received so far. So we have top three opportunities. So based on the scores, we're going to give every single team a list of three opportunities to work on based on their scores. So in this case, I feel safe disagreeing with the way my team does things, opportunity number one. Number two, I feel included by the people I work with. And number three, my team values my contributions. So if I go into recommendations, we're going to get three recommendations per opportunity to be able to see what's going on with that team. So teach inclusion as a human need and right. Share your story, learn their story. Conduct frequent, brief touch points. And then we get into results over time. So this survey is interesting in the sense that it is meant to be a pulse survey, something that we take more than once over time because psychological safety, as we've discussed, is delicate. It changes, it's variable based on what's happening in the microculture of the team, the macro level environment. You have something like COVID that hits and maybe we wanna see what effect that's having on the team from a psychological safety perspective. And so we recommend quarterly surveys to see how the team is trending. And in this results over time, you can see it broken out by stage and aggregated by overall. Uh, we got a question in the chat. Connie, do you ask the same questions quarterly? Yes, we do. It's the same items uh, each time. Mm -hmm. Then we have open. Tim, did you want to say something? Yeah, you, you, there's another question that came in that I thought was really interesting. Uh, someone asked, well, what if you have exclusion? How do you know if you have exclusion or patterns of exclusion that are coming from the team versus coming from outside of the team? Yeah. Well, that's a question that we can find in the open-ended comments. Yep. And this is where we want to look to crack open the numbers, to bring some color to that quantitative data. It's important that we look at the qualitative data as well. And this is interesting because anonymity is very important. And so we've done some things here to help preserve that. Obviously, the, the way that we report out all of the data is aggregated from the get-go. We don't break out. You can't find out who responded what, but we've imposed a 150 character limit on the open-ended comments. And this forces people to really consolidate everything that they want to say into a concise one, maybe two sentences about their feelings regarding the item. So we ask, what is one thing that prevents you from feeling included on your team, safe to learn on your team, safe to contribute, and safe to challenge the status quo? So in this case, I've only got three responses in here, but depending on how big your team is, this can get to be a pretty hefty list and yeah. gives you very interesting data to show you what's going on inside of your team and very specific things that you could address. We've tried to make this as practical as possible, and this has been very helpful as we've attempted to do that. So I won't go into any more detail on this results page, but this is the main dashboard where we can see how a team is doing. I will say just before we, we get closer to the end of the webinar, this is free right now until next Friday. We almost hesitated uh, sharing that with you, but <laughs> we, we will keep this free for the first survey until next Friday, at which point we have some different pricing that's going out. But if you want to use this with your team, you're welcome to. We've made it for that purpose. So if you'd like to deploy this, you can do that. You can go to fourstages.app. You can sign up. You can add your team members. You can roll out the survey uh, and you can do all of that. I just wanted to let you know that that's available to you. So next up, we have the action planner. This is called the 5P action planner. And this helps us take all of that data and reduce it into some very specific actions that we are then going to go and implement to improve psychological safety. Because it's one thing to get the data and just talk about it and know where we're at. It's an entirely different thing to then go and do something about it and improve. And that's largely been a big disconnect when we've talked about psychological safety in the past. It's been very difficult to make that transition from theory and conversation to action. What do we actually go do to improve the situation? So the first thing that we want to do is help a team understand why are our results the way that they are. And so we're going to encourage them to ponder. What patterns do you see in your results? What surprised you? What are your team's strongest areas and why? Weakest areas and why? I love this next question. How would your team be different 
if you could significantly increase your psychological safety. Describe your team's future state, okay? These auto save on fill. And then we ask people to prioritize. We've given three recommendations, but you guys know the situation and context better than we ever could and better than the system could. And so we leave it to you to prioritize three different items that you're going to be working on in between surveys. So in this case, I'm accepted as a member of my team. Maybe we pick that one. We can look at the list. Maybe we pick this other one that we scored pretty low on, and then we pick one more. We will, at, we will enter, why did you select this item? My team, dot, dot, dot. These will auto save every time you log in, they'll be there for you. And as you run multiple surveys, you can pick that up here. Then we go into planning, okay? We've prioritized and now we're going to plan. What do we do? To plan means to create an intended course of action to accomplish your goal. And then we answer these questions. The same is true for practice and the same is true for perform. We want to do deliberate practice and then incorporate the progress that we make through deliberate practice into natural work and we rinse and repeat. This is a cyclical process because the job is never done. We can resurvey the team in a quarter, see how we're doing, improve. New implementation, a few different recommendations, and we go from there. Some of you may be familiar with our behavioral guide. This is another resource that we have to help you improve each of the stages. So if you come in here and you click on the icon, you can see a definition of the stage and then a long list of behaviors that you can implement to improve that specific stage. So in inclusion safety, we have share your story, learn their story, follow through on small commitments, forbid personal attacks, et cetera, et cetera. And they, these lists exist for each of the four stages. Junior, let me, just it, say, let, me, let me say a word about the behavioral guide just so everyone understands the behavioral guide is based on a comprehensive review of the research literature for psychological safety and also uh, based on uh, sociometric research that is being done at places like MIT. So, so what the point is that you have to be able to identify concrete actions and behaviors in each stage. And that's what the behavioral guide contains. So for each stage, we have distilled out the concrete behaviors that members of a team need to demonstrate consistently. And that, of course, is a free resource. And so I just wanted to explain a little bit about what's in that. Yeah, I appreciate that. And as I've been looking through the chat, the comments have been very positive. And I just wanna say thank you. You guys have helped us get to the point where we are today in psychological safety and developing this platform. The user feedback has been amazing and we've made tremendous progress. And just wanna say thank you for that. So uh, we did have a few more questions in the chat about how to access this. I think someone did link it in the chat. It's fourstages.app, fourstages.app. You can register and run your first survey free until next Friday. Uh, it's mobile compatible. We've tried to, to be as compatible as we can be. So for those of you on an old compact running Windows 95 and Netscape, we, we thought of you too. Or <laughs> yeah. A Blackberry from 2002, it probably will work. <laughs> okay, so with that, uh, I'm not going to go into this too much more. Um, I will say a few different things. If you want to learn more about this specifically for your team, in the post webinar email, we will send out some additional information on how you can use this and on how you can get in touch with us about how to use this. We are always happy, our entire team is happy to have conversations about how to implement this at your organization. So a few different things I wanna mention before we go. The first is the upcoming webinar. I'm gonna throw these links in the chat, okay? So this next webinar is called DEI and psychological safety, why most companies get it wrong. This is something that we've had many discussions about internally and with many of the organizations that we work with. DEI is very, very interesting and something that we want to break open and help you understand a little bit more as it relates to psychological safety. Tim, anything on that? Yeah, well, and uh, we're, we're going to have as, as our guest, Maver Richard, who's the former associate dean of the Stanford Business School. She'll be joining our conversation. Uh, absolute pro, a DEI 
professional and executive for many years. She'll be joining the conversation. So I would encourage you to participate. It's going to be, it's going to be fantastic. Then the next thing is the certification. So we do offer a certification for the four stages of psychological safety and have made it inexpensive. We've tried to make this as accessible as possible. This gives you all of the deck to present the four stages in a variety of formats. You get admin permissions inside the four stages tool. You get access to an exclusive LinkedIn group with certified trainers and coaches and several other things. So I threw that link in the chat as well. The August 21st session sold out. The September 10th session has four seats left and we just opened another session for the 24th. So if you are interested in that, check out that link and you can register directly there. Tim, anything you want yeah, to say? Yeah, I would just say, if you're interested, this is a global community of some of the most talented coaches, trainers, and consultants in the world. And so if you have an interest in becoming certified and joining the global community of certified coaches, I, I would encourage you to do it. The, the level of talent and experience is incredible. Yeah, it's amazing. And it's an area, it's a, it's a forum where we can collaborate and cross pollinate and we learn from each other. It's fantastic. Yep. Then the last thing I'm going to put in here is about the giveaway. So if you hung out this long, thank you for sticking around. Hopefully this helps. So the, we are going to pick one winner. So the, what you need to do to enter is on LinkedIn, describe your experience with the webinar, tag Tim, tag leader factor and use the hashtag psychological safety. That will enter you into a drawing. 10 people win a free digital copy of the four stages of psychological safety, the book, and Tim's holding it up now. And one team will win a guided setup and administration of the four stages of psychological safety survey. So you don't have to go and figure out how to do it by yourself. I personally will walk you through it step by step to make sure that it's applied in the best way possible and walk you through your results at the end. So if you're interested in doing that, uh, that's available to you. So once again, we've got the webinar coming up. Um, definitely sign up for that. We've had wonderful participation. And for you people that have been here from the get-go for all five at this point, thank you. We appreciate you. You guys are make these webinars what they are. And thank and, you for contributing your insight. Oh, it's amazing. We take and we incorporate into our design with the platform. Srivatsa, been on all five. I love that. This is great stuff. So then we've got the certification. If you have questions about that, uh, we're going to send information about that in the post webinar email as well. And then the giveaway. So once again, uh, just a couple asks from you guys. If you've enjoyed the webinar today, go search us in LinkedIn, search leader factor in LinkedIn and click follow. That will subscribe you to the updates that we put out with psychological safety. We also have content around EQ, change management, several other things that we think you may find interesting. But the psychological safety is the focus right now. If you want to stay up to date with what's going on with us, particularly, and in the industry, that's a great place to do it. Also on YouTube, if you would subscribe to us on YouTube, that's where we're going to post all of the recordings of the webinars. We also have a big list of videos on there that give a little bit more color to the behavioral guide. So for those of you who've downloaded the behavioral guide and want a little bit more information, that's a great place to go. So we're about at the hour. Tim, anything else you want to say before we sign off today? Yeah, I just want to say thanks very much. And I want to say to all of you, thank you for caring about psychological safety. Uh, it's amazing, but the people that care about this topic are people that care about human beings in general. And we appreciate that. Yep. Thank you guys for all that you do. Have a wonderful weekend. Take care.